All right, Heidi, you're good to go. Oh, thanks so much, Michelle. And um, thank you all for taking time at the end of your week to be here with us today. My name is Heidi Lersch. I'm an educator and training coordinator for SAFE's Disability Services, and my pronouns are they, them. And I'm going to start out our presentation today by talking about substance use. Um, and we've had a little bit of a technical glitch, and hopefully my co-presenter will be able to join us and cover the rest of the mental health um, sections that we prepared for you today. That being said, like Michelle said, we will probably have additional time for questions and answers around substance use. So please pop your questions into the chat. I'm happy to answer any questions you have and to discuss as we go. I'm gonna zoom us forward to our substance use section to get us started. So in this part of the presentation, we're gonna look at substance use and survivors. We'll look at the intersection of substance use, trauma, and violence. Our learning objectives for today are understanding the different substance use models and the role substances play in a survivor's life and in their recovery. We're gonna explore the connections between childhood trauma, substance use, and domestic violence and sexual assault. And finally, we're gonna look at trauma-informed strategies for supporting survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault who you experience substance use disorder. And I wanna start with this quote that says, our work with survivors with substance use issues will be more effective if we do not expect survivors to release one coping skill until they have developed another. If we provide support rather than shame, and if we de develop flexible policies that provide for the well being and safety of all survivors. And so today, when we talk about survivors and substance use, we're really gonna look at substance use as a coping mechanism that survivors develop, a normal coping mechanism that survivors to develop to deal with the abnormal experience of violence. And when we shift our perspective to see substance use as a coping mechanism, then that helps us understand that survivors need replacement coping mechanisms before they can um, adapt more um, healthy skills to leave that other coping mechanism behind. So a little bit about language identity and diagnosis as we talk about survivors who use substances. So in recognition of the harm that social stigma and shame around substance use causes people, we're, we're seeing a necessary shift in the language that we use to talk about substance use disorder and in the language that we use to talk about um, approaches to treatments for people who use substances. So in the DSM-5, all reference to substance addiction and abuse has been removed because we know addiction and abuse carry really negative um, connotations and we don't want to increase the shame that individuals feel around substance use. So addiction and abuse have been removed from the DSM-5 and they've been replaced by substance use disorder. And substance use disorder in the DSM-5 sees substance use on a continuum from mild to severe. And as far as the language that you use to talk about substance use and survivors in your work, we really always want to focus on language that's least likely to cause harm. So in general, you're not going to use the terms addiction or abuse um, or any other derogatory language to refer to substance use or to people who use substances. But at the same time, it's really important that you recognize the survivor's right to define for themselves um, how they wanna talk about their identity and how they wanna talk about their substance use. And so in the cases when a survivor self-identifies as an addict or identifies their substance use as substance abuse or addiction, you are going to mirror the language that that survivor uses to talk about their identity and their substance use when you're speaking with them about their substance use. And if you are ever in doubt about how someone wants you to talk about their identity or substance use, it's always better to ask, 
hey, what language would you like me to use when we're talking about your substance use and your identity and your diagnosis? So now looking at thinking about substance use on this continuum, it can be helpful to um, understand indicators of the, of the different um, parts of that continuum. So it can be really helpful to know what, what might be an indicator that someone is early on in their substance use or that they might have mild substance use disorder, um, as well as indicators that someone is later on in their substance use and their substance use may fall into that more severe category. So I wanna talk about a couple of indicators that you'll see on this slide here. So one of the things that, that we know about early substance use is that people like it. They say that they, they like using the substance. So when people begin to use substances and they fall into that more mild um, place on the continuum, they report that they like to use the substances. And as people continue to use substances and changes in the brain begin to happen, that liking using substances is replaced by a compulsion and a wanting to use substances, a feeling like they need to use substances. So the, their um, feeling of like goes down and their feeling of want and need goes up. We also know that with prolonged substance use, there are neurobiological changes in the brain that actually make it more difficult for an individual to withdraw for an individual to, um, to moderate their use and for an individual to abstain. So those are very real changes in the brain that make it more difficult for people to recover from substance use when it is severe. Some other signs that the sub uh, survivor's substance use is falling into that severe place on the continuum are that they feel worse. <laughs> when they stop using, they feel worse. They start to have those really intense withdrawal symptoms. And again, they have that feeling of needing and wanting to use that substance, that compulsion. We know that people, when people are more early on in their substance use, they feel better when they stop using. They don't have those withdrawal symptoms. They don't have that compulsion and that wanting to need constantly. And then the effects on uh, an individual's life related to their substance use are gonna escalate as the substance use becomes more severe. So early on in, in an individual's substance use, we, might, we do see negative consequences, negative social, um, legal and health outcomes, and those effects are going to intensify as the substance use becomes more severe. Sorry, I was just checking the chat just to make sure I didn't miss anything. I saw several notifications. Um, another sign that someone's substance use is falling into that more severe category is that they have engaged in repeated attempts to stop the use and to control the use, and they're, and they're really struggling there. There's that desire to stop and control the use, but again, thinking about those neurobiological changes in the brain, it can be extremely difficult for people who have severe substance use to um, abstain from use. All right, so now we're gonna look at some models for understanding substance use. And first we're gonna talk about the medical model um, for understanding substance use. And the medical model looks at substance use as a chronic disease but is it impacted by a variety of factors? And these factors include brain chemistry. So some individuals may use substances in an attempt to balance brain chemistry and brain chemicals that are related to pleasure, that are related to inhibition, that are related to anxiety and agitation. The disease model of substance use also looks at research that shows a strong link between genetics and predisposition to use substances. It also looks at mental and emotional stressors and how they may contribute to an individual's likelihood to use substances. 
The disease model looks at psychological factors such as depression and low self-esteem and how those psychological states may contribute to an individual's risk of using substances. And then finally, the disease model considers social and cultural pressures. So it looks at the, the paradoxical way that our society um, views substance use. So on the one hand, we see substance use really glorified in media. So movies such as The Hangover um, and really glorified in, in cultural events. Um, but at the same time, we see so much societal shame and blame around individuals seeking treatment for substance use. And that paradox can mean that individuals are encouraged by society and peers to use substances and at the same time discouraged by society and peers to seek treatment if, if they do identify that they have a substance use issue. And then we've got the trauma model of substance use. And in the trauma model, trauma, including early childhood trauma, is seen as the dominant factor in an individual substance use. So um, the trauma model looks at substance use as a normal response to the abnormal experience of trauma. Um, we know that in early childhood, when children experience trauma, that also creates changes in the brain that can make it more difficult for children um, throughout their life to process and deal with negative emotions. And that makes it more likely that a person will seek external supports and, and external ways of coping with those negative emotions that they have from the trauma they've experienced. And I'm oh, sorry, I did not mean to go to the next slide. Um, and the, so the trauma model sees substance use not, not as a disease and not, not as a sickness, but as a response. And I really like um, a quote from Dr. Daniel Sumrock, who is the director of the Center for Addiction Sciences at the University of Tennessee. And Dr. Daniel Sum Sumrock says that we should replace the word addiction with ritualized compulsive comfort seeking. Ritualized compulsive comfort seeking. Dr. Daniel Sumrock says that substance use is comfort seeking at its core. Um, and when we think about substance use as ritualized compulsive comfort seeking, then we can relate. <laughs> you know, we all seek comfort when we're dealing with overwhelming hard emotions or difficult memories, um, we, we all do that. We all have our rituals that kind of help us feel okay, that help us feel balanced. Um, but for individuals who have experienced trauma, they might be seeking comfort to deal with really extreme overwhelming feelings. And they might be finding that comfort and that ability to cope in substance use. So thinking about the trauma model of substance use, I want to look at the, this tree analogy that psychotherapist Heidi Bandera uses to illustrate why it is so difficult for survivors to stop substance use if the core root of the trauma is not addressed. So at the bottom of the tree, we see that the roots are previous trauma that an individual has experienced. In the trunk of the tree, we see that that's where someone's internal state is. And this says internal state of addiction because this is taken um, directly from, from Heidi's analogy. Um, but we see someone's internal state. So that internal state can include all of those really difficult negative feelings that come when a person has experienced trauma that internal state can include trauma responses that a person is continually having to deal with and to manage. And then in the branches of the tree, we see external coping behaviors. And these external coping behaviors allow a person to survive and to continue while they're having these, these really intense, overwhelming, 
negative internal states caused by trauma. Um, and if we look at this model, it's, it's easy to see if you cut off a branch of the tree, if you cut out one coping mechanism, then it's not solving, it's not solving the root of the issue. You've still got the previous trauma and the person is still going to need to find coping mechanisms to deal with that internal state that's resulting from their previous trauma. So looking at this, we can see why individuals may cycle through uh, maladaptive coping mechanisms when the root of, of, of their trauma is not addressed because they'll continue to have that internal state that they have to manage. So continuing to look at the trauma model of substance use, um, it's important to talk about the really strong connection between early childhood trauma or adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs, and the risk for substance use. So we know that when a child has experienced at least one adverse childhood experience, um, they are four to five times more likely to start using substances um, early in life. We also know that when a child has experienced five or more ACEs, they are 10 times more likely to develop substance use disorder as an adult. So we see a direct connection um, between trauma, especially early, early childhood trauma and, and later substance use disorder. Um, in a study of more than 520 women with substance use disorder, almost 60% reported experiencing sexual abuse. Almost 70% reported experiencing physical abuse. So again, this connection between trauma and substance use is so strong. And substance use, um, like I talked about previously, is often a normal response to the abnormal experience of trauma. And in our work, um, part of our job is to help survivors develop other coping mechanisms to replace the substance use that they have used to survive and deal with and manage the experience of trauma. So we also know that the co-occurrence of mental health disorders and substance use disorders are extremely common. So 50% of people with mental health disorders also have substance use disorders and vice versa. Unfortunately, we know that there are not enough comprehensive treatment systems to help an individual receive treatment simultaneously for both a mental health disorder and substance use disorder. So of the 4.6 million adults with that dual diagnosis, only 6% receive treatment for both. And why is that? That's because we have fragmented and siloed services that don't provide that comprehensive treatment. Um, so too often substance use disorder treatments focus on ending the substance use and don't focus enough on addressing the previous trauma. And too often, domestic violence and sexual assault crisis centers address the trauma, but may not accept individuals who are currently using substances. And then too often, mental health services don't look at the combination of an individual's needs to heal from trauma, an individual's needs um, regarding support around their current substance use and an individual's needs um, regarding their mental health. So when we look at how siloed and fragmented these services are, it's easy to understand why survivors may spend years um, looping through services and systems and never getting their needs met in a comprehensive way that allows them to really move forward. So now we're gonna look at the intersection of substance use, trauma, and violence. 
So we know that substance use does not cause violence, but substance use may increase danger. Um, we know that when a survivor or a perpetrator is using substances, it might be more difficult for that survivor to assess the true level of danger. Um, so research shows that when a perpetrator is high or drunk, they are more likely to seriously injure or kill the survivor. We also know that as, if a survivor is using substances, um, they might not be able to accurately assess their ability to protect themselves um, in, in a dangerous situation. Substance use, of course, can impair thinking and judgment, and that can make it more difficult for a survivor to enact a previously planned safety plan. And then for a survivor that is currently using substances, they may be less likely to leave or call the police due to fear of arrest for the substance use um, or due to fear of custody. If children are involved, they might fear losing custody due to their substance use. And unfortunately, if law enforcement is aware of a survivor's past or, past or current substance use, that might make law enforcement um, less likely to see the survivor as a credible witness when reporting abuse. And Michelle, I see a lot of notifications in the chat. Will you just let me know um, as questions come up? Yeah, there's no questions. Just a lot of comments like, <clears throat> um, you know, in Northeastern Washington State, very rural areas, our services are, are lacking horribly great challenge in, you know, finding these services. Um, the name of the, uh, Vanessa asked the name of the doctor you're quoted, but I think that's Kelly Ott, who's not a doctor. Is that right? Um, yeah, that's the right. quote. That's Kelly okay. Ott, the, the quote at the beginning. Um, right. The other doctor that I referenced, Dr. Daniel Sumrock, um, was the doctor that talked about replacing addiction with um, the term which ritualized compulsive comfort seeking. Great. And yep, that's about it. Um, I, I just and I was just saying, you know, this fear is real. The perception of fear is what's real more than like, because sometimes there's those safety harbor type policies or laws that say, you know, if you're reporting a crime and you're high, like, well, you know, it doesn't really matter if those are in place because the perception is that, you know, is that fear of that um, as well as when it's compounded by different people's experiences of oppression and racism and things like that in the world. And then somebody else said it can also lead to survivor distrust of police systems. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there are so many systems that a survivor interacts with some, some, um, some which are legal and some which are just other systems that the survivor may fear um, that that system might judge them, that services might be withheld if their substance use um, is discovered. So, so yeah, a lot of fear um, in a lot of different ways for survivors who are currently using substances. All right. So we also know that um, substances can be used as a tool of power and control in, in domestic violence and intimate partner violence um, in relationships. Some ways that perpetrators might use the survivor's substance use to have power over them and control them include the perpetrator might um, force the survivor to take drugs or might drug the survivor without their knowledge to incapacitate the survivor. Um, the perpetrator might actually look for victims who they know have a substance use um, issue. We know that perpetrators are really skilled in looking for victims who they feel do not have a lot of power. Um, we also know that perpetrators might use a survivor's substance use to control um, their behavior. Looks like Heidi's frozen. Let's just give a minute here.
You froze just for a minute, Heidi. Okay, yeah, I was uh, I got out of the presentation so I could check check my internet connection. Sorry about that, y'all. No problem. Okay. This is this is what's real lately. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. All the things. <laughs> All right. Um so Michelle, will you let me know where I left off? Yeah, I would just um start I would just go, go through this slide again, I think. Okay, sure, sure. Um, so we know that uh, a survivor's substance use can be used by a perpetrator to exert power and control over that survivor. Um, some of the ways that a perpetrator might do that are they might force a survivor to use substances or they might drug a survivor without their knowledge in order to incapacitate that survivor. Um, Perpetrators might also look for victims that they know have substance use issues. We know that perpetrators are really skilled in trying to find victims that they feel do not have a lot of power. Perpetrators might also use the substance use as a way to force survivors into sex work, into stealing or committing other crimes, into dealing um, to obtain drugs or money for drugs. And this can be twofold because um, not only is the perpetrator controlling what that survivor is doing, but they're, if they are forcing the survivor to commit a crime, then the perpetrator can also use the fact that they have knowledge that the survivor committed a crime um, against that survivor to further control um, their behavior and to have further power over that survivor. Um, we also know that perpetrators are likely to sabotage a survivor's um, recovery and they're likely to isolate the survivor from people that they feel may support that survivor's recovery. Um, perpetrators might also, kind of like we were talking about on the previous slide, perpetrators might also um, use threats around a survivor's substance use, such as threatening, reporting their substance use to immigration services, reporting the substance use to CPS, reporting the substance use to law enforcement, um, reporting the substance use to the survivor's employer. So. Um, what we see are there are lots of ways that perpetrators can use a survivor's substance use to gain more power and more control. Heidi? Yes. There's a question in here, but I also had kind of a, a thought or a comment on that as well. I remember working with um, a survivor who would force her abuser to use drugs or for them to use together because then she knew that when he used, then he was less likely to turn his attention to her. He would turn his attention, even though you might think like, oh, you know, meth will make somebody more violent. She was actually saying, let's use. And then, you know, he would like work on a project or something like that that would like, so, so I feel like there's just so many different ways that folks are using substances to um, kind of distract uh, and be part of that safety plan sometimes, which can be something we might not think about being like, that, that seems like a really bad idea, but they always know best, right? How, how that's gonna interact. Um, and then Maria had a question. How can we help change the narrative to better inform and change the stigma attached to substance use disorder? My experience is, oops, my experience is there is sometimes a negative perception among even healthcare and mental health professionals, I want to be able to have discussion with sensitivity. Many times those negative perceptions have carried, um, you know, for a long time. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, and I think that we can start with the language that we use to talk about survivors and their substance use. Um, one thing that you can do whenever you're in conversation or meetings with other professionals um, or, or other people coming to the table um, focused on that survivor is to model model language that that is compassionate and that is trauma informed. Um, and so not saying addiction, not saying abuse, um, always reframing a survivor's substance use as a coping mechanism um, that they have developed to in order to survive trauma. Um, if we think about if we think about the tree analogy, right? If if those coping mechanisms don't exist, the person is not able to tolerate that internal state. Um, and so while I think a lot of conversation is focused on the harm that substance use causes. I think we we need to um, we need to keep in the conversation the fact that the substance use allowed the survivor to cope, 
However, we on the outside feel like maybe that, that it's been maladaptive and it is causing harm. Um, we still have to recognize the fact that, that that substance use has allowed a survivor to cope. And again, talking about substance use as a normal coping response to the abnormal experience of trauma. I hope that answers, I hope that answers your question. Um, and thanks, thanks for sharing that, that Michelle. Um, just always remembering that survivors are the experts in, in their safety and, and they're also the experts in, in, um, in the people who use violence against them and, and they know best how to navigate that. Um, and, and that might be something that, that is talked about when you're safety planning with a survivor who uses substances or with a survivor um, who has a perpetrator who uses substances. You know, you might ask questions about, okay, tell me what happens when, when the perpetrator uses substances, what does that look like? Um, what is the, the, the um, level of danger when that happens? And then you'll be able to find out more information about, okay, when the perpetrator uses, they, they're focused on a project, you know, or when the perpetrator uses, the, the level of danger goes up because they become more aggressive. And then you can help the survivor safety plan um, according to that information. All right, y'all. So now we're gonna look at trauma-informed support strategies for survivors who use substances. Um, and we're gonna start by talking about harm reduction. Taking a harm reduction approach is one of the most important things you can do in your work to support survivors who use substances. And harm reduction, you know, just, just as it says in the name, is looking at the risk for harm and working to reduce the amount of harm that will occur. And um, y'all will be really familiar with this concept because um, reduced to its essence, harm reduction is safety planning. Uh, we also all use harm reduction all the time, you know, to reduce the level of danger when we know we're engaging in behaviors or activities that carry inherent risks. So for example, if you've ever had a designated driver, that's harm reduction. If you're making sure you're drinking water while you're drinking alcohol, that's harm reduction. Um, if you are wearing a seatbelt or a bike helmet, that is harm reduction. Um, and as much as we can normalize the fact that we all use harm reduction, um, that helps us better support survivors and better understand that for some survivors, the goal is not abstinence and that for many survivors, abstinence might not be an option at the moment. Um, so we talked about coping mechanisms and, and developing replacement coping mechanisms. If a survivor has not had the space and time to develop those alternative coping mechanisms, then abstinence may not, may not be a possibility for them in the moment. Um, the other thing about harm reduction is it returns, it returns dignity and control to the survivor and it centers the survivor as a person who um, while they're using substances, still has the capacity to pri prioritize their own safety and to make informed choices. When we present survivors um, who use substances with all or nothing options, that takes away, that takes away their sense of control. Um, and it, it sets them up for situations that they might not be, be ready for, you know, and um, if we do that, it can also increase the likelihood that they're going to relapse. It can increase um, the likelihood that their healing will be delayed because they'll be stuck in this cycle feeling like they have no other option. Either it's they stop using altogether um, or they have completely failed. And that's not reality. What we want to do is make people safer. And sometimes that means talking with them about how they can use in ways that are more safe. Um, some examples of harm reduction are needle exchange programs, methadone, um, buying less substance so that the survivor uses less substance at one time, um, the survivor making sure that they're a safe environment when they use the substance, the survivor trying to make sure that they're around safer people when they use the substance, um, the survivor eating and drinking before they use the substance. Um, Harm reduction can also include uh, making sure that someone in the survivor's life or directly 
with the survivor has um, naloxone, which is a drug that can save people from opiate overdose. So these are all examples of harm reduction and there are many more. And the specific harm reduction that you talk about with the survivor will really depend on um, where the survivor is at in their substance use and what the most immediate safety and danger concerns are for that survivor. So looking at kind of step-by-step -step harm reduction um, practices, the first um, and, and almost most important thing that you can do with a survivor is help them to understand the function of their use. And so if we think back to the trauma model, understanding that substance use is a coping mechanism that allows the survivor to deal with previous trauma, helping the survivor understand how their substance use is related to their previous trauma um, not only helps the survivor understand that, that they've developed this coping mechanism, not because they're a terrible person, but because they needed to survive. And in that moment, that's what they needed to do to um, manage, manage that internal state resulting from trauma. So it normalizes, it takes some of that stigma, some of that shame out of, out of substance use. Um, and the other thing that understanding the function of the use does is it helps the survivor to think Looks like Heidi is frozen again. Let's wait one second. Let's see if they come back. You're back. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> oh, so sorry. It wasn't, it wasn't, it's, it's not very long. It's just like a, a short pause. Okay. Um, so understanding the function of a survivor's substance use um, can not only help take some of that shame and stigma away um, from, from their understanding of their substance use, but it also helps survivors understand what might be good replacement coping mechanisms for their substance use. If they understand the function of their substance use, then they can brainstorm, hey, what's going to be an appropriate coping mechanism to help me deal with this internal state that I've been managing through substance use? So once, once you've done that with the survivor, then you want to identify the actual problems related to the substance use. So kind of going through these major areas with the survivor and, and talking with them about like, hey, what are, what are the health concerns? What are the most immediate health concerns? What are the most immediate dangers? Um, or the, you know, what are the um, possible most negative consequences in all of these, these areas. Um, so talking with survivors about their physical health, you know, are they at risk for developing a, a disease or, um, or other health condition from the substance use? And, and, and how high is that risk that they'll develop that? Um, their psychological health consequences, you know, are, is the substance use contributing to, um, states of psychosis or contributing to uh, depression or anxiety that the survivors experience? Um, how is the substance use affecting their relationships? Uh, is it preventing them from having a support system that will help them maintain their, their recovery and healing from trauma? How is the substance use affecting their livelihood, their ability to, um, to gain employment and their ability to, um, to take care of themselves and, and any children or family that they may have? Um, what legal issues does the substance use potentially, um, potentially pre uh, present? So talking with the survivor about possible issues with CPS, talking with the survivor about possible, possible um, issues with law enforcement if, if they are caught using substances. Um, you know, how does the substance use affect their parenting? How, how is the substance use affecting their children? Um, and then in general, looking at what are the most immediate safety needs. And so when you go through this with the survivor, it helps the survivor understand and prioritize what they want to address first. 
you know, so what, what is causing the most harm and how can you and the survivor or how can you work to support the survivor to reduce that harm? Um, it can also help the survivor create a timeline where they're saying like, hey, this is the most immediate harm that, that is happening and, and we, want, we want this aspect of life to improve and to stabilize. And then later on, we're gonna address some of these other harms that we know are happening, but may not be immediate and the survivor may not be able to address those harms at this moment, but you can help the survivor make a plan to get there. So like I just said, um, the next step in, in, in a harm reduction um, process would be to prioritize which issues require attention first. Um, once you've identified those issues, then you wanna brainstorm with the survivor, what are some potential solutions? Um, and whenever you are working with a survivor, you always want to defer to the survivor as, as the expert in their life and in their experiences um, and in their substance use. And what you can do is be as creative and flexible as possible and really, really listen to what the survivor is telling you. Um, believing what the survivor says when they make suggestions of things that they feel might work or solutions that they feel might be effective. And then you can work together to, to choose those solutions. Okay, for, for this most immediate harm, here, here's the solution that the survivor has presented. Um, what are the supports gonna be to support the survivor in, in following through with that solution? And what does accountability look like? When are you gonna check in with the survivor about that? You know, how are you gonna follow up and how are you gonna help the survivor follow through with this plan? Um, that you're supporting them in creating. And then the next step is to implement the plan. Review the plan periodically, um, make sure that there's that accountability that you're gonna check in, hey, you know, where are we at? And you're gonna reevaluate what is the most immediate harm because that might change as the survivor situation changes or that might change as the survivor um, works to reduce harms. You know, so once, once the survivor has addressed one issue, then what's the next issue? Um, that the survivor can look at and, and consider the harm and how they can reduce that harm. So the next step is to really um, thoughtfully consider your agency policies around survivors who use substances. You wanna look and think, is this policy trauma-informed based on what we know about substance use and based on um, knowing how, how interconnected substance use is to the experience of trauma. So um, whatever your policy is, you wanna make sure that you're providing that policy information um, right up front and you're presenting that policy information in a clear and non-judgmental, compassionate way. Um, and we, we've talked a little bit about, you know, removing some of the shame and stigma around substance use. So you wanna be um, really thoughtful about how you can present your agency policy around substance use in a way that is not likely to make the survivor feel more shame about their use or to feel like they're failing in recovery if they relapse. That's not what you want at all. You don't wanna to contribute to that shame. Um, research actually shows that the more shame someone feels around their substance use, the harder it is for them to recover. So anything you can do to Normalize substance use as a coping mechanism developed to be able to survive trauma. Um, you want to do that. And that might mean looking at what, what is the specific language that included in the policy. Is that language trauma informed? Um, another great approach instead of dictating to a survivor, hey, here's our policy. If you do this, this is going to happen. You know, if you do this, this is going to happen. Um, instead of dictating, having a discussion with the survivor about safety, you know, like saying up front that your number one priority for the survivor and everyone that you're providing services for is safety. Um, and because that's your number one priority, there are things that you have to consider. And those things, can, um, those things include substance use, you know, and what kind of risk substance use potentially presents. You can ask the, the survivor about safety around substance use having a discussion is gonna take some of that um, feeling of judgment away because you're not dictating, you're discussing with the survivor and talking about their safety as a priority. Some other things to consider are rather than ending services, 
um, you can help survivors think about what are the next steps and how can they still receive services um, related to whatever whatever situation the survivor is in next. So um, if your policy is that survivors cannot use substances in, in shelter, and um, that means that a survivor has to move on from the shelter services if they use substances, can you still provide counseling for that shelter? Um, I think one of, one of the only <laughs> positive things come out of this past year is, is the frequency that people um, are using or are transferring their services into um, virtual platforms. So that means that you might be able to continue to provide counseling services to help a survivor heal from the trauma virtually, regardless of where that survivor goes next. Um, if they're going into a substance use treatment program, you might still be able to continue your counseling services. And so how can, how can you support the survivor um, if they do need to leave a specific part of your services. And that can help, again, remove some of that shame. It's not like, you know, you follow our rules or that's it, you're out, you know, you, you need to move on. It's like, hey, how can we be here and continue to work with you and keep that door open so that if at, a, you know, a later point, the survivor is in a place to maybe return to shelter, that they feel like they can do that. And they feel like they're coming back into a non-judgmental and compassionate environment that will support their recovery. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some screening questions that you might include on an initial intake. Um, it's important that whenever you're screening a survivor for substance use, you let the survivor know that these screening questions are to help you and the survivor evaluate safety concerns and not to screen the survivor out of services. Screening a survivor out of services due to um, current substance use is not only unethical and not trauma-informed, it's very likely a violation of the ADA, depending on the specific context in which it happens. Um, so you'll notice that a lot of these screening questions are phrased in a way to, to again, try to reduce any shame or stigma associated with substance use. So some of these screening questions include Many people tell me that their partners don't want to drink or use drugs alone. Does your partner ever make you want to drink when you don't want to? You could even say, does your partner ever encourage you to drink with them so they don't feel alone? And so you can be really mindful of language when you're asking these questions. Has your partner ever sabotaged your recovery from substance use? Has your partner ever made it harder for you to engage in recovery? Um, has your partner ever used food or rent money to buy substances? People I see often tell me they feel stressed. There are several ways to deal with stress, what works best for you. Some people use substances to, to deal with stress. You know, um, Is that something that you ever use to deal with stressors that might come up in your life? So looking at these questions and always evaluating for safety and, and making sure that however you are phrasing the question, your delivery is also making the survivor um, not feel judged. So remember that 70 to 90% of your communication with survivors is actually nonverbal. So your response, I mean, your reaction to the survivor's response to these questions is important. Um, you never want to react in a way where you're showing surprise or, or disgust or any kind of negative reaction, um, you should anticipate that, that many survivors uh, are using substances or have used substances in the past. You should also anticipate that survivors might um, be in a place of denial or be in a place where trust has not been built and they are not ready to disclose their substance use to you. These are additional screening questions that you can consider, um, including in an intake that will help you evaluate safety um, around substance use and will help you talk with the survivor about their substance use um, and centering their safety. So for example, if someone has recently used and they don't have a plan to stop using, if they are using a drug such as alcohol, 
where they need to be in a medically supervised um, recovery program in order to withdraw safely, um, they might need to wait until they can get into a medically supervised um, recovery program before they withdraw or abstain from alcohol for safety reasons. Um, and you also, this is also a great place to kind of start talking about harm reduction with the survivor if they are open to it, to start thinking about um, when is the last time you used, do you have a current plan to stop using? Um, there are a lot of different treatment programs and treatment approaches and getting to know the survivor better can help you recommend um, and talk with the survivor about the most appropriate options for their treatment. So I think we all know about AA and NA, and that can be a great program for many people. For many people, that's not a good fit. Um, there are alternative programs, and it's important to consider a survivor's identity and intersectionality when you're thinking about treatment programs. So for example, if a survivor is queer, they might feel more comfortable and be, and be more successful in a treatment approach that, that, that is in a queer space. Um, with other queer people who use substances. Um, there are also programs such as Women for Sobriety that are, that are women-only spaces. Um, and then there are programs such as White Bison, which is a, a Native American and Alaskan Native recovery community that's nationwide that might be helpful um, in supporting that survivor's recovery. So there are lots of options out there, including moderation management. Um, that can be a program for individuals who are early on in alcohol use, but needing tools to, to moderate and manage their use. So a little bit about supporting families of survivors who use substances. If the survivor has children, you wanna be really clear about mandatory reporting and the guidelines that you have to follow as a mandatory reporter. Um, so a disclosure of substance use in and of itself does not um, require a mandatory report. And so you can communicate that clearly to the survivor. Um, and then you also wanna communicate communicate clearly that if you ever suspect abuse or neglect of children, that you are mandated to report. And you can walk the survivor through what that would look like if you have to report and bring them into that process so that they know what to expect um, should you need to report for the safety of their children. Um, when, you, when there are children um, of a survivor who uses substances, you want to always meet with those children separately so that they have a safe space to be honest about um, their needs and to be honest about how their parent substance use is affecting them. And then you're going to assess what those needs are and um, provide, provide the relevant services as soon as possible for those children. For older children, it might be appropriate to refer them to Al-Anon or Alateen so that they can um, have some solidarity and support as, as, as their parent um, recovers from trauma and, and substance use disorder. When you're safety planning with a survivor with substance use disorder, of course, you want to think about immediate danger levels related to any violence that the, the survivor is experiencing, excuse me, experiencing and related to the survivor's um, substance use. So some things that to consider when you're helping the survivor develop a safety plan around using are how can they deal with cravings and how can they deal with potential um, craving triggers? So you wanna look at what, what can the survivor do when they're feeling hungry? Um, what can the survivor do when they're feeling angry so that they don't default to that coping mechanism of substance use? How can the survivor um, deal with feeling lonely? What are, what are some supports you can put in place should that, should that come up for the survivor? How can the survivor deal with feeling tired? So, Thinking through these, these potential major triggers um, that might, might lead a survivor to use substances again and, and helping the survivor plan around, around each of those. And then thinking about what else can survivors do to maintain sobriety and safety, and that might mean helping survivors seek community and solidarity. Um, in a minute, I'm going to talk about 
the importance and effectiveness of peer support programs. Um, at SAFE, we have a really amazing peer support program and our su peer support professionals contributed enormously to this training and to our manual beyond labels. Um, peer support programs are really, um, can be just the safest place for survivors who use substances because they're shared power and they're shared experiences. As far as outside support groups that are not um, that are not part of DVSA programs or not part of the peer support programs, survivors should be really careful about what they share in, in, in those groups and in those support programs. Just recognizing that we know that perpetrators in, infiltrate you know, every aspect of our society, including um, substance use recovery groups. Uh, so one, one thing that a survivor can do to to um, increase their safety when they're attending outside groups is to be really careful about what they're sharing in those groups and how much identifying information um, they're sharing. As far as support groups in DVSA organizations, um, you wanna always, of course, protect, protect confidentiality using first names only, limit the notes that you take, limit what goes into the file, you know, because we talked about the shame and the stigma of substance use. Um, and recognizing that anything in a survivor's file, um, anything that you write about substance use might follow them um, and might negatively impact services that they receive in other settings. So be really mindful about what you're putting in notes, how you're talking and writing about the survivor and their substance use um, in any formal way. And of course, with any group, um, you always wanna be upfront about mandatory reporting when you're required to report and what that reporting will look like and how the survivor will be notified and involved of that reporting. Um, and just a reminder that the AD, ADA does, does provide protections um, for people who have achieved or are working through sobriety. Um, so making sure that you are following the law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that you're also following the spirit of the law and um, making sure that your services are accessible to people with disabilities, to people with mental health disorders, and to people with substance use disorder. So some steps that staff can take. Um, to increase your trauma-informed services for survivors who use substances include anticipating and learning how to support a survivor when they're negotiating legal and other problems. So um, we've talked a little bit about the potential for arrests, um, the potential for reports to CPS, to um, immigration services, to employers um, for survivors who use substances and kind of anticipating what that might look like based on what you know about the survivor um, and what systems they're engaged in. Providing parenting classes, knowing that substance use can interfere with a survivor's um, ability to be the parent that they wanna be um, and talking with the survivor about what, you know, what that looks like for them, how they wanna grow as a parent and how you can support that. Um, parenting classes are gonna help survivors feel more confident as parents, um, help survivors feel more confident in, in learning skills. Um, and so that can be a really positive thing for survivors who might have some shame and guilt around how their substance use has affected their parenting. Of course, you always wanna be consistent and flexible. Um, ideally, you develop policies with room for flexibility and creativity, remembering that each survivor's situation is unique um, and the more flexible and the more room you can provide for the survivor to um, come up with creative solutions to, to whatever issues they're facing, then the better able you are to support survivors. Providing resources and support for other issues. So remembering, you know, the likelihood that a survivor might have a comorbid um, condition. They might be experiencing mental health disorders at the same time as they're experiencing substance use disorders. Um, and you can help the survivor look at services and, and try to help the survivor um, get their needs met as they're interacting with these really siloed um, services and support systems. 
course, you want to address substance use issues promptly, and that's why we talked about, you know, initial screening questions for you to help evaluate safety and concerns around substance use. Seek consultation. So, you know, as a, as a DVSA center, you don't have to be experts on substance use and on substance use treatment. You know, you can reach out to the experts in your area, get training and education from substance use treatment programs in your area or from, you know, from, from support groups like AA and NA and other um, specific support groups in your area, learning more from them and what their services look like. The more you know, the better you'll be able to inform survivors about options for treatment and recovery. Um, and then finally, considering hiring peer support specialists. Um, peer support specialists can just create those safe spaces for survivors who use substance use to share their experience without um, being afraid that others in the room are going to judge them or shame them or blame them. Um, they can be really peer support, peer support um, groups can be really integral to survivors' recovery. A little bit about relapse. Um, so expecting that relapse is going to happen and seeing relapse not as the end of recovery, but as part of recovery. And helping the survivor to see relapse not in a way that is shameful and not seeing relapse as a failure, but seeing relapse as a learning opportunity. And the more that a survivor can learn from what led to a relapse, what conditions um, made it more likely that that survivor would relapse, the stronger they're gonna be moving forward in their recovery. Um, recovery is a learning process, it's not a destination. Um, and the more a survivor can learn from their experiences, um, the better able they're gonna be able, they're gonna be to um, move forward in their healing from trauma and, their, and in their management of their substance use. Some things that can help a survivor, you know, really analyze that relapse and learn from it are um, writing a relapse of the history incident, considering the factors that led to relapse, discussing the relapse with adults they trust, discussing the relapse in peer support groups, um, talking to a sponsor, if they do attend a support group, being open with that support group about where they are in their, in their recovery, and then taking all of that information and developing a plan of action for what they can do next time, and putting all that information into any harm reduction strategy, strategies that you are supporting the survivor in using. Um, so if you're looking at, you know, at what harm reduction strategies have been successful and unsuccessful, if if a certain harm reduction strategy has not been successful, then maybe it's time to get creative and look at another harm reduction strat strategy should the survivor find them in a similar, find themselves in a similar situation in the future. Um, and then finally, if it is necessary to end services um, for whatever reason, whether the survivor is choosing to leave services or um, the survivor has, um, has crossed the boundary as far as as far as your agency's policies, you can end services in a way that's compassionate and doesn't completely close the door. You never want to, um, again, you never want to shame a survivor for choices that they have made in their recovery, remembering that recovery is a learning process and it's not a destination. Um, and you want survivors to re. Um, you want survivors to come back to your services when they're in a different place or to continue using parts of your services that make sense for their current situation. Um, so you can remind them of the agency policies, but also remind them that you want to continue to support their healing from trauma and their recovery. And here are some options in the future should they choose to take advantage of different services. And then having that open, honest conversation about safety again, um, that using um, while in the shelter or while receiving other services might, you know, might not be the safest option, not only for them, but for others. And that your job is to always center their safety um, when you're providing services. All right, y'all. <laughs> so that was a lot of information. Um, we have some time. We have some time for questions. Um, so if there are any questions in the chat or if there are if there's any discussion, um, I'd love, love to engage in that. Um, 
But uh, as, as you're thinking about questions, there's some resources on the slide that I referenced during the presentation. Um, so I encourage you to, to check out these resources, these treatment options. This is Michelle. So a couple, couple things in the chat here. Um, in our, uh, Kathleen says, in our little rural communities, we have been collaborating with many resources to be able to meet the needs of, and goals of uh, survivors and clients. I am a sexual assault advocate and finding that my clients need and are asking for so much more help, such as mental health and recovery. Um, someone else says, this can be challenging when working with people in the substance use disorder field. Some are very anti-MAT, medically assisted treatment, like methadone. Um, mm -hmm. And I've worked with survivors who have struggled with that. Uh, another, who is this? I can't tell who this is, but this other person says, I have worked with survivors who are engaged in substance use disorder treatment and struggle to feel validated in this way and have had lengthy conversations with them and their substance use disorder counselors to try to uh, and support them better. Um, so that's the conversation that was happening in the chat. If, if anybody does want to just um, uh, ask a question instead of putting it in the chat, if you raise your hand, I can unmute you and um, you can just speak directly to the group. Yeah, thanks, thanks Michelle for sharing what's in the chat. Um, um, it's really encouraging to hear how y'all are reaching out um, and, and collaborating with other services so we don't have those siloed, fragmented services and being an advocate or helping a survivor advocate if advocate for themselves if they're in a service that, that is also causing harm um, and inhibiting their recovery. Um, here's Deborah. If you can unmute yourself and ask your question, Deborah. I have allowed you to speak. It happens all the time. Thank you. Um, I just want to say one of the things that I'm really excited about as far as uh, one of the things that we've done in our agency is partner with the local uh, inpatient facilities. I can't hear you very well. You have to either speak up or... Is that better? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, had, I had the little microphone piece on the wrong side. I had the wrong earbud plugged in. <laughs> Um, one of the things that's really exciting is that we've done in our area is partner with the local inpatient facilities, and we've been able to do presentations. We're actually right next door to the pregnant and postpartum women's facility, and so we do uh, weekly groups over there, and they're able to come right next door to access our services because, you know, of the statistics of how many women who experience such disorder are also survivors of physical or sexual assault, and uh, because of that partnership and relationship, we were able to do an outreach at the harm reduction program or needle exchange, and they've changed their uh, paperwork to ask if someone is a survivor or is being trafficked and if they'd like to speak to an advocate. And it has really opened doors for us and created a, I think, a, a better connection between the substance use community um, as far as like the professionals as well as the clients to be more aware of our services. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing, Deborah. I mean, as you were talking, I was thinking like, oh, how can how can we help um, substance use uh, treatment centers or and mental health um, treatment centers look at their intake? You know, are are they screening for past trauma and and thinking about how that contributes to to uh, a survivor's mental health and substance use? That that's so amazing. Thank you for sharing. Um, in the chat, Maria is asking, do the resources include any online peer support services or can you recommend? There's a substance use disorder counselor in our area who recently passed away to the shock of several clients. It is rural and there are a few options. Yeah, so there absolutely are um, online substance use treatment and support programs. And Michelle, I can get you a longer list of okay. those. But um, as I was as I was researching, it's only expanding. And then I think, you know, one of the good things to come out of this past year, like I said before, is more, um, more organizations are moving their services online and, and reaching more people. Um, Debbie says, 
uh, who is at the, who works at the Dove House, has a recovery cafe under the umbrella of our services. Recovery circles, trauma-informed yoga, amongst other wonderful services. Very cool, Debbie. Yeah, that's awesome. That's another, just like, you know, any, any way that you can help survivors feel solidarity um, and, and engage with, with communities um, and, and other activities that can really help support their recovery from trauma and help them manage their substance use. <laughs> Debbie says it's amazing, lots of good food as well. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I was thinking about, Heidi, when you were talking about screening is, you know, just one way that I try to put myself in someone else's shoes when I'm thinking about screening is thinking about when, you know, my doctor will ask me, like, how many cigarettes, when I used to smoke, like, how many cigarettes a week do you smoke? And, like, just exaggerating it, lying about it to make it seem less. Um, same with, like, how many, you know, drinks do you you know, drink a month and, or when the dentist is like, have you been flossing? Like how many days, <laughs> you know, just those yeah. kind of things. And when you get those questions asked, there's just like this panic to lie and to try to figure out what it is that they want to hear. And so I think that that's something to really keep in mind in, in any of our kind of screening things, you know, we're asking about things that are, uh, that are personal, that are private. Um, and also that, you know, sometimes you don't want to have the wrong answer to, and you don't know the answer. So you're trying to kind of figure out what that is. Um, and just practicing ourselves as advocates, a lot of honesty and transparency to really model, like, we can have this kind of conversation. We can, um, you know, anything you want to tell me, you know, to, to do that trust building kind of, because it's just such an important piece of that. So that was something that I was thinking about when you were talking about screening. Yeah, definitely. Any any way that you can make that feel that process feel less clinical, you know, I think the better. So if you don't have a clipboard in front of you where you're writing stuff down, that's great. If you're having a conversation with a survivor and it's more of a discussion and you're continually um, making sure that the survivor knows that you're having this conversation because you want to support their safety and, and that's it. And the more information that you can share with them and that they can share with you, the better able you are to support their safety. And, and one thing that I I just really know about myself is that I like a form and I will gear myself to it instead of a conversation if it's in front of me. So that was something I had to really learn about myself as an advocate is that I need to have a conversation and then, you know, my memory is good enough that I can fill in all the stuff later. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. And then, or pick it up at the end when we're, before we leave just to see kind of what else I might need or ask follow-up questions. And that was always a trick that really helped me more engage in a conversation than have those kind of critical intake or screening conversations. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing that you can do is, is towards the end of a conversation, just check for your own understanding. Um, that can be a good way to make sure that you're not missing anything, you didn't misinterpret anything, and, and it can also make the survivor feel more heard. Oh yeah, a little active listening in there for sure. Yeah. Thanks, Heidi. Kathleen says, I loved the tree. So many just don't understand that trauma is so deep rooted. It takes so much victim centered and trauma informed care from all resources. Yeah, I love the tree also. And I feel like we should talk about the tree more, you know, in all settings. Um, I, I think that also, you know, even sharing the tree analogy with the survivor, if they feel like they're in a place to see that can really help them understand the coping mechanisms that they've developed and how those coping mechanisms have helped them survive, but that they can also develop replacement coping mechanisms um, and, and heal from the, those roots of trauma. Can you actually go back to the tree and let's look at it again? Yeah. And that might, because I'm, I'm like trying to remember and just think about like if, Yeah, like if, if we had something, like even just this as a visual in an office or something like that to help as a reminder, but also as a symbol to folks to know, like it's safe to talk about addiction here um, too. Um, I, I feel like sometimes those symbols are important in offices. Yeah, and you can, you know, I think you could even even name the external coping behaviors, you know, um, and, and the variety of, of 
of coping behaviors that people use to deal with trauma. Again, just like normalizing, you know, eating disorders and um, substance use and how, and then have a longer conversation with survivors about how um, those coping mechanisms have helped them survive this, this internal state. And, but they can develop other coping mechanisms that um, are less likely to cause them harm. I know that the next time that we meet, which um, because Shell is having such a challenge today with, with our technology, we're gonna do a third um, session to talk about um, self-harm and, and some more mental health um, issues um, next month. And so I'll let you all know so you can jump back on there uh, if you're interested. Of course, it will be recorded again. But cutting is something also that I know is just so very connected to this to this tree too, and it's so common for sexual assault survivors, and that it does become a compulsion addiction type behavior that's really hard to stop. Um, and so I feel like there's a lot of things that really translate into and are connected with um, both with using substance because of the, the endorphins that it releases um, and just the, um, um, that that becomes like an addiction to your own like internal hormone drugs, right? Almost. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Especially when we were talking about um, how survivors may use substances to balance their own brain chemicals, you know, and that, and balancing those brain chemicals can be an attempt to to cope with unbearable internal states, you know, um, whether it's cutting in those endorphins or or substance use. Oh, any more uh, hands up um, if you have any comments or questions? Um, we have plenty of time um, since we decided we were going to um, add on a third session. We have lots of space to be able to have these conversations so we don't have to rush. So please feel free um, to, to put up your hand or put something in the chat. I'm gonna I'm gonna pop my email 